Some very useful features in the book include several indexes. First, there is the table of contents. We can see that the book is organized sequentially. Chapter 1 is up to 1800, and the next five chapters are based on decades. Starting in 1850, each chapter contains material for one year, and then it gets back to decades later in the book. Next is a list of documents that were available in the Brighton Library at the time that the research was being done. I don't know exactly where we might find every one of these specific documents today, but it sure is fun to browse down through this sequential list and get a sense for the development of the community over time. For example, there are many items about changes and improvements in the roads, and it mentions names and places. Word of warning, get interested in this at your peril. Make sure you have time to spend. There's also an index of names, which provides page numbers for references to individual people, and this is very useful. There's also an index of photographs, maps, and newspaper clippings. This is very useful because there are many of these, especially clippings from the Brighton Ensign newspaper which appear more in the second half of the book. There's also an index of places and subjects. In light of all these indexes, it's easy to find almost anything that's in the Toby book. The content we find in the Toby book varies widely. Let's look at a few unrelated items. On page 31, we find a sketch of Presque Point, an area that was created to support a petition in 1821 by the folks who wanted the village of Newcastle to be moved to the mainland. I've added a few notes to the sketch for clarity. The sketch shows the town of Newcastle there on the bay shore of Presque Hill Point and Freeman's Point across the bay to the north. A note on Freeman's Point says that this land had been reserved in 1818, so it was available for the people of Newcastle at this time. On page 76 and 77, we find the actual petition, and it reads in part. The town of Newcastle, shorn of its courthouse and goal and other buildings, fell into neglect. On March 20th, 1821, James Richardson, Jr., Dr. McGregor Rogers, James Lyons, and others petitioned His Excellency Sir Peregrine Maitland, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, saying that the town of Newcastle was so difficult of access that it will be a long time before it will be settled as a town. And persons who had lived there had moved away. It was also mentioned that Freeman's Point had been used as a refuge for pirates during the War of 1812, and the local people would feel more secure if this area could be occupied by farmers and a village. In the end, the authorities agreed, and the people who had lived on Presque Hill Point for several decades moved over across the bay to the north. However, it was not until the late 1840s that the name of the village would change from Newcastle to Gosport. This change was due to efforts by the government to improve the efficiency of the postal system, due to the fact that so many places in the province had the same names. Newcastle in Durham County, up the lakeshore to the west, had become a town by this time, so the little village of Newcastle on Presque Isle Bay had to change its name thus the village of Gosport. On page 66, Brighton historian Isaac Wellington provides an amusing anecdote related to his grandfather, George Gibson. We might remember George Gibson as the partner of Charles Selleck in 1804, as they waited in vain for the arrival of HMS Speedy at Newcastle in order to conduct a murder trial. By 1825, George Gibson was an elderly man, but still present and active in the community. 
This story tells of his extreme response to the first steamboat to enter Preskill Bay. The story goes, Although Grandfather had helped to build many a large vessel, yet he had never seen a steamboat. One day, the Frontenac puffed in to the harbor. The old gentleman, on hearing the noise, sprang to his feet and asked what was making all this noise. But as he saw the ship rounding Salt Point, entering the harbor and dropping anchor, he raised his hands to his head and exclaimed that the world was coming to an end when you see a ship running without sails. In later times, many a hearty laugh did the young people have at grandfather's expense over his first sighting of a steamboat. The Frontenac had been built in 1816 at Finkel Shipyard in Bath and was a sensation across the province. This image of the Frontenac is an artist's rendering, and it represents what the ship may have looked like when it sailed into Presqu'Ile Bay on that summer day in 1825. If we think about it objectively, we might be able to sympathize with George Gibson's alarm. He had been building and operating sailing vessels all of his life, and now at age 70, he beheld this monstrosity was making all this ungodly racket that he never associated with a ship in his entire life. And it was belching smoke from its deck, which in his experience meant extreme danger. On top of all that, it was running without sails. It's no wonder that George Gibson felt that his world was coming to an end. Of course, in hindsight, we can say that it was really just a sign of the changing times. The village of Brighton was named in 1831. On page 106 of the Toby book, we see this quote from area newspapers. Pursuant to notice, a meeting of the inhabitants of Cramy and Murray was held at Union Hall, kept by Mr. S. Kellogg, on 2nd April 1831, with the purpose of naming the village in progress at that place. Among the great variety of names proposed, it was decided by a committee created for the purpose that the village should be called and in the future be known by the name of Brighton, Jesse Wells' secretary. Union Hall was a hotel and tavern located at the southwest corner of Prince Edward and Main Street, owned by Simeon Kellogg. We can see a sketch on page 130 of the Toby book that makes this very clear. A committee had been struck to decide on a name for the village because of growing confusion due to competition between two settlements that were close to each other on the Kingston Road. To the west, around Ontario Street and the southern terminus of the Percy Road, was Bede's Corners, named after the Bede's family who had business interests in the area. To the east, at the three-way corner of Young, Maine, and Prince Edward, was Singleton's Corners, named for John Singleton, an early settler and landowner in the area. Joseph Lockwood was appointed as the first postmaster of the village, and his suggestion of Brighton carried the day. The village was named after Brighton in England, which was well known as a very popular seaside resort frequented by royalty we might expect that the name was slightly aspirational. Oh, and one more thing. The secretary for this meeting was Jesse Wells. It turns out that this Jesse Wells lived at Hilton, and he would be the grandfather of Nettie Wells, who would be the mother of Maxwell Toby. Yeah, it's a small town. <laughs> The Toby book contains pictures and information about old buildings that we might recognize. Here's the standard bank that used to stand on the northwest corner of Maine and Young, now Sobey's parking lot. Today you can't miss the segment of the front entrance that's standing there as a monument at the corner. This is the old public school, which used to stand on the north side of Richardson Street across from the canning factories. 
It was replaced in 1916 by a new building on Elizabeth Street, which itself has recently been replaced with a new structure. As mentioned, there are lots of newspaper clippings in the Toby book, including many advertisements, such as here on the left, an ad about a grand menagerie, a spectacular event held in Coburg in 1840. On the right is one of many advertisements about women's clothing, here showing the styles in 1915. Many of the ads will crack a smile, such as this one about Ford cars in 1918. It says, Replace your buggy with a Ford. More than 100,000 Fords are owned by people in Canada in preference to their old horse-drawn buggy and other makes of cars. Modern advertising for automobiles is much more sophisticated, of course, but the basic concept hasn't changed very much. A few years earlier, in 1914, the editor of the Brighton Ensign newspaper felt it was important enough to print a list of the 51 people in the community who owned automobiles. This list is shown on page 659 and 660. It includes the usual suspects, the Wades and Lawsons and Morrows, and many more. This might seem crazy to us in our world of automobiles, but it does show how much the world has changed in a century. <laughs>